Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I see we're on air. Um, next week, we have Peggy Weil from the California College of Art in San Francisco. She just recently moved up there from uh, USC, where she was. And she's done a bunch of really interesting explorations sort of on the borderline between art and computing and politics. So uh, virtual reality visit to Guantanamo, things like that. So, She's got a lot of interesting thoughts about uh, how those relate. So that's next week, Peggy Weil. This week is the second in our sort of unintentional series of how do games all fit in. Uh, we didn't think of it that way when we scheduled it, but last week Leighton Reed talked about uh, games and, the, and uh, social behavior. And this week we have Rajat Paharia, who, as with a number of our speakers, I'm proud to say was a student in our uh, group. Uh, many years ago. Um, I know he looks young. He looks like he's still a student, but uh, it was a while. And um, after finishing the, the HCI Masters here, he went to Phillips Research Lab. Is that lab still exist at all? Uh, not here, no. Not here, yeah. <laughs> I think they've, they've, they've moved. Went from there to IDEO, uh, worked as a designer at IDEO for several years, and then decided he'd catch the startup fever himself, uh, and went off and did a startup on the question of uh, what is it about game behavior that can be taken advantage of in a more general application world? Uh, I know that for many years I've always said in HDI courses, nobody does this except games. Nobody yeah. pays attention to audio except games. Uh, so games have been really some of the most interesting and far out HCI uh, examples for many, many years. And so uh, he's addressing how do you bring that into the web in general. Great, thanks. So. Um, Thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk today about participation engines, which is all about, you know, you're building experiences, whether they're um, content experiences or educational experiences or, you know, corporate intranet for employee experiences, whatever kind of experiences you're building, you want people to engage and to participate and how we can use game dynamics and behavioral economics to drive and incent and motivate that participation. Just to kind of reiterate what Terry said, the background, why I think about this and know about this stuff. Um, I'm the founder and chief product officer of a company called Bunchball, and this is what we do. We have a software platform that companies use to incent and motivate uh, user behavior online. Before that, I was in the software experience design practice at IDEO, uh, a software engineer at various companies. My background is as an engineer, and then I was in the HCI program here, as, uh, as Terry mentioned, from 97 to 99, and before that, an undergrad degree in computer science from Berkeley. So. Um, the first part of this talk is going to be all about metagames and about how to drive participation using metagames. So what is a metagame? Metagames are all about statistics, right? So if you and any of, uh, you know, all of us in this room are playing a game, let's say Monopoly, and we sit there and we play and we come back again tomorrow, we play again and we do it again and again and again, it's going to get kind of boring after a while, right? But as soon as we start capturing stats, who won and who lost? Uh, how many dollars did each of us end the game with? Who ended the game with Boardwalk and Park Place? Once you do that, then there's all sorts of very interesting things you can do to motivate and incent people. By taking these individual experiences and persisting these statistics out of them into this persistent outer layer, you can now drive people to um, try and get for uh, status, for achievement, for competition. Am I the number one ranked player at Stanford, in Palo Alto, in California, the world? Uh, was I able to own Boardwalk five games in a row? Because if I was, I got a special reward. All those kinds of things you can now do, you can now drive just by virtue of capturing statistics. And if you think about it, every major sports institution out there is basically a giant metagame. If two football teams played against each other and you weren't capturing stats, nobody would care. Right? What you care about is how these two teams are doing in their respective leagues. How have they done in their last 10 matchups? How is this offense done against this defense? It's those statistics that make these things so compelling. And so intrinsically, like everybody, you know, everywhere understands metagames and already kind of to some degree plays them. So, but we're not here to talk about monopoly or football. We're here about it to talk about interaction and participation and engagement online. Rating, reviewing, commenting, voting, submitting, playing games, coming back more frequently, spending more time on site. These are all things that you want for your applications or your websites or your uh, experiences that you're building. And so these are all statistics you can be tracking. Your users are talking to you through their actions and you can be listening and responding in real time with automated incentives and messaging to get them to do more of what you want them to do. 
And really, the way it works is by leveraging human desires. We're all pretty basic. We all have uh, needs and desires for these things, rewards, status, achievement, competition, self-expression. Yet you look at most sites today, uh, experiences, applications, how are they addressing or leveraging these fundamental human needs? And for the most part, they're not. They're completely ignoring them. Yet game designers have known for years how to incent and motivate player behavior. And they do it by using these various mechanics or dynamics, points, levels, challenges, virtual goods, leaderboards, gifting, and charity. Well, oop. That was a bad button to press. There we go. And, uh, and what you can see from uh, this grid is that game designers have done a really nice job at hitting this broad spectrum of human needs and desires, with green being the sweet spot for that particular mechanic and blue being other areas that it hits. So let's talk about levels. Levels is frequent fire programs. It's belts and karate. It's job titles. It's this idea that I've reached this milestone, this level of accomplishment in the community, and I should be afforded a certain amount of respect and status for having done so. Maybe even unlocking access to new abilities and content. So you know, just to take frequent fire programs, you know, I get double miles when I, uh, when I hit Premiere, Premiere Exec, and I get access to the red carpet, and I get Premiere seating. Like, all that kind of stuff all comes with leveling. That's primarily about status in the community, but it also hits on individual achievement because it feels good for me to get to the next level, and competition because it feels good for me to be a higher level than all my friends. And I'll describe the rest of these to you just in the context of showing you some, uh, a bunch of demos. And, and I'll, I'll send these slides to Terry, by the way, in case anybody wants a copy of these. So I talk fast. Don't worry about that. <coughs> So the first one I'm going to show you is a site uh, by NBC for uh, uh, a TV show called The Office. So on The Office, they all work for this fictio fictional paper company called Dunder Mifflin. And so NBC's issue is the TV show is on for 22 minutes a week, 22 weeks out of the year. And they got to figure out how do we keep all those users engaged between episodes and between seasons. And so they're building internet communities around all their marquee shows uh, to keep those fans activated and engaged. And, uh, sticking with the program even in all these downtimes. And so one of the ones they built was for The Office called Dunder Mifflin Infinity. It was actually part of the storyline of season two. Ryan, I don't know if you guys watch it, but Ryan, uh, the intern, launched a website, a social network for people that like to buy paper. So the premise is, I come here and I join as an employee and I join a branch of Dunder Mifflin and I participate in the social network and the branches compete with one another. So First thing is, how do I get paid at Dunder Mifflin? Well, they've got Shroot Bucks. Dwight Shroot's one of the characters in the show. And Shroot Bucks are just points, right? Shru uh, people love points. They love to earn them, to achieve them. They can be indicators of status and seniority in a community. There have been studies done, IBM Research, New York Times, about the dramatic effect that points can have on user behavior, even if there's no monetary value associated with them. People love to be rewarded. They love to feel the status, the seniority, to have feel feel like they achieved something. So here, employees will get paid Shroot Bucks by doing simple things like uploading a photo or video, changing your favorites, rating an item, posting in a discussion board, or adding a comment. So they're incenting everyday participation in the experience, in the application. And then you can also get them deducted for getting flagged for inappropriate content or getting fired. So they're counter-incenting bad behavior using Shroot Bucks. And that's how I can earn up to 100 per week. But the real reason NBC did this on their website was because they knew they didn't want to have to have a big site production team creating new content every week. They wanted the users to generate all the content. They wanted the users to do all the work because they wanted the website to run itself. And so they came up with this task structure where once a week they would come up with a task that they asked everybody to do and they would pay them in Shroot Bucks for doing it. So just for submitting a piece of content, user-generated content, you earn a bunch of Shroot Bucks. And then if yours is voted best in your branch or the entire website, all of corporate, you'd earn a bunch more. And NBC loved this because they're paying all these users fake money to do real work and create all this content that everybody's engaging around that week. So you can see some examples here. Uh, script and film yourself in an ethical situation. Come up with a mission statement for your branch. Design a logo, etc. Right. So now the site really does kind of run itself. They're just incenting users with this fake currency to do all this work. So then the question becomes, what can I do with this fake currency, with my Shroot Bucks? You can do two things. You can buy items for your desk or send them as gifts to your coworkers. And then as your balance increases, so do your opportunities for promotion. You can level up in the community. This is the profile page of someone who did pretty well. They're an assistant regional manager. I'm a temp in this community. I'm at the bottom of the corporate ladder. You can work your way up through 12 different levels all the way up to assistant regional manager. You do that by earning more Shroot Bucks. And then, along with the status, you also unlock access to new abilities and content on the website. Then I've also got here my uh, total earned Shroot Bucks in my lifetime that I currently have available to spend. So you know, constant tracking of how I'm doing in this community. This is a seniority number, the 12,310. That's like 
you know, the number that only ever goes up and never goes down that indicates how much time I've invested in this community. And then this is my current balance of what I can actually go out and spend on my desk. So every user at Dunder Mifflin has a desk. And it's just a virtual space. And you don't need to build virtual worlds by any stretch. Just simple self-expression components that give users a place to spend, a reason to want to earn, and the ability to customize something that reflects their identity. Because that gets them invested. It gets them locked in. And it becomes a really great vector for creativity and competition and self-expression on the website. So what we see here, this guy was the assistant manager. So he's got what looks like a nice office. And then everything you see here, all these virtual goods are items that this user bought and placed and like spent the time to earn the shroot bucks to buy this stuff to customize and deck out this office. My office looks like I have a table in the middle of the hallway somewhere because I haven't done a whole lot. But this guy had the nice one. And you know, I was, I was giving a talk in a marketing class at Berkeley. And the professor was just like stricken with disbelief. And, like, why would anybody take the time to do this? And you know, the thing I had to explain to her was, in this community, this is what people see. People can't see my real desk. They can't see my car. They can't see my fancy house or any of that stuff. What they can see is my desk. And that's my indicator of status and investment in this community and seniority and how much I've earned, right? This is my representation. People care about their representations online just as much as they do offline. Uh, this is the store where I can go buy more stuff. And so I've got a full store of Dunder Mifflin stuff. A lot of these were actually taken from the set of the show. I've got things like manager exclusives, things I can only buy from a certain level. We talked about unlocking content when you hit a certain level. So uh, you can do all that kind of stuff here at Dunder Mifflin. And then they've got high score tables. Every game ever made has a high score table. It's aspirational. It's fame. It's your name and lights. It's also how am I doing against my friends and against everybody else. Most games only have one because there's only one metric they measure, which is score. But using our APIs, you can do a high score table on any site activity you want. I'm sorry, I, like, I flipped into like sales mode all of a sudden. <laughs> using game mechanics, you can, you can, uh, you can track, you're tracking all these statistics. And uh, once you're tracking all these statistics, then you can do high score tables on any site activity you want to, right? Who's uploaded the most videos, rated the most photos, invited the most friends? Who's done it the last day, the last week, all time? Who's done it just against my friends or against the entire site? You have the ability to create all these different contexts for competition to drive valuable behavior online on your site or in your experience. And here, I clipped the screenshot, unfortunately. But you can see I've got individual high score tables here, top 10 movers and shakers, employees, but then top branches as well. Group competition, also incredibly powerful. People love affiliating with something bigger than them. Teams, groups, schools, whatever you want to call it, and then competing and collaborating in that context. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then I'll show you one other uh, kind of social networking type site. This is called eastman.com. It's part of the Hearst Teen Network. So they've got this currency called bottle caps. And the thing to note here is um, this little piece of toast in the bottom right-hand corner. Like if you've ever used Outlook or an IM client, you know they're always popping up little things in the bottom right-hand corner telling you about things that have happened. Real-time feedback is incredibly important if you have an incentive and reward system in place on a site. Uh, this person just got 100 bottle caps for logging in, it shouldn't be that you find that out later today when you happen to visit you know, your profile page or some other place and see that you're in those points. You want to let that person know right when they did something of interest so that you can reinforce that behavior so they'll do it over and over and over again. So real-time feedback uh, when you're doing this kind of system, very, very powerful and very important. And so here on eSpin, we can see all the different ways I can earn bottle caps. So we talked about all the different behaviors you can drive, uh, connecting with other people, updating parts of my profile, logging in, et cetera. Basically, any kind of behavior that you can track with a piece of code, you can capture a statistic on, and then you can incent and reward that here with a varying number of bottle caps, depending on the value that it provides to the community. And then this is the avatar uh, widget they have here. So you know, there, you, you, when you've got a virtual currency or economy, you've got to be thinking about earning and burning, right? Like most uh, experiences have no problem figuring out ways for users to earn. Every time you add a comment, every time you tag, every time you submit a piece of content, um, that's no problem. But then burning, how do people actually spend these things? There's a couple of different ways you can treat this. One is you can say there is no burning. Uh, it's completely a status thing, and people just continuously, like, the numbers get higher and higher, and it's all about status and seniority in a community. But then you can also think about what are other opportunities for burn. If you've got an experience or a site where you can gate access to content, um, that's a great way 
to burn, right? So I'm engaging with the site in order to buy the currency to engage even more with the site, to unlock access to some content or some ability on the website. You can also use things like virtual goods, like the desk at Dunder Mifflin, or like an avatar system here. Self-expression components that give users the chance to customize an identity that follows them throughout the site. Everywhere where their name shows, a little snapshot of their avatar, their room shows, so they get invested in that experience and in that identity and want to make it look better, and so therefore want to keep earning. And there's a whole bunch of other burning mechanisms we can talk about. And then we should talk about challenges. So if any of you um, have ever played Xbox games or on, on Pogo, challenges are giving users missions to accomplish and then rewarding them for doing so. It's giving them goals. People love having goals. They love feeling like they're working towards something. Most websites have no towards. You're just there. You're being. You're doing. But you're not going anywhere. In the game world, they figured this out. And the stellar examples here are Pogo and the Xbox 360 with Xbox Live. Xbox Live, every new game comes with 12 or more of these. They're called achievements. And usually the first one or two are really easy to get. You get them just by playing the game. So you're sitting there playing Hexic, and something pops up saying, congratulations, you've just won the Star Cluster trophy. Click here to check it out. And you do, and you see your bright, shiny trophy. And then you look at these 11 gray boxes down below. And you start looking at those going, oh, I can get that one if I just go back in the game and do this. Now they have you hooked. Now it's like baseball card collecting or Pokemon where you want to get them all. You want the complete set. People hate having holes in sets and are always trying to complete them. Uh, Pogo, Electronic Arts casual gaming site. 35 and up female demographic correlates. So we're seeing how this stuff kind of spans age groups and genders, right? Xbox is like young males, Club Penguin and Webkins are young kids. Pogo is older females. These guys release two new ones every Wednesday. They call them badges. And every Wednesday, Pogo servers get slammed because everybody's in there trying to get the two new trophies to keep their sets complete. And Pogo can use these trophies to drive traffic to underperforming or new parts of the site, new experiences that they want people to try out. So I might never have heard of the game Spider Solitaire, but if this week's trophy says I have to play 10 games, I will because I want the trophy. And it's not just for me. It's not just about individual achievement. It appears in the case on my profile page that everyone else can see, so it becomes a status symbol in the community as well. There are whole websites. Go to badgeaddicts.com, like devoted to Pogo badges. Like people are obsessed about these things. And they're 40 by 40 graphics, right? But again, it's giving people a goal, a mission. And people love feeling like they're working towards something. You've got to have a towards. <coughs> Uh, and so we can see here uh, examples of rewards, you know, giving currency, giving virtual goods. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to kind of branch out into some other interesting examples here. Microsoft and Beta 1. So Microsoft, when they're working on Vista, um, they tend to you know, try and dog food their own projects, right? So try and get people internally to run uh, beta builds of Vista and test it. And they're having trouble, right? They send out emails to everybody, and managers are sending emails to their subordinates saying, you know, everybody, we need to dog food Vista. Everybody try it out and you know, try and run it and see what happens. And so this time, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they said, we're going to try and build a game out of it. And they built the dumbest game you could possibly imagine, right? So I've got to test Windows Vista. Here's the game. You earn a B for installing the beta, an E for voting on a version, a T for running it overnight, et cetera. And then there's a page on our intranet that has everybody's letters, you know, kind of ranked. The people with beta up top and bet and B, you know. Like, that's it. That's the game, right? It quadrupled participation overnight. And I mean, just by having this simple little comp competitive status metric, right? And this is a quote from, uh, I don't know if this was, um, I think this is from Changing the Game, not from Layton's book. But you know, people are talking smack in the halls and bragging about their status on the leaderboards. And VPs would run into the office and say, where's my E? I earned it last night, right? Because they didn't get credit. So just even something as simple as this. And you know, this is, this is a kind of a fascinating internal Microsoft project. There's another thing that they just released a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft Office Labs, called Ribbon Hero, which I thought was fantastic. And the, the premise here is um, Microsoft Office is you know, tons of functionality that most of us never, ever use, right? Or never even know about, to even know that we're not. We don't even know what we don't know, right? So, um, and then they've recently redone all the UI in the latest Office version, so it's got the ribbon up top, which is in infuriating to a lot of people, and, and they don't even bother wanting to learn how to use it. And so Office Labs has released this new plugin called Ribbon Hero, and this is a, a screenshot of it from PowerPoint. It just adds this little button right up here uh, on the upper right hand of your score, and I can see my current score in Ribbon Hero. This is the game I'm now playing to learn and utilize all the functionality in PowerPoint. Um, this is a quote from one of the people working on it, but basically, you know, they started this project looking to see if there was a place to use games to drive learning 
uh, in things like points and friends and achievements and all that kind of stuff. And then this is the interface when I actually um, click through. And so I can see my PowerPoint achievement here, how many points I've earned on the scale. I've got uh, various challenges I can take, missions, goals to accomplish, and I'll get rewarded with more points for doing them. And they include things like learn how to use bullets, learn how to do custom animations, all that kind of stuff, right? So they've turned learning Excel, Word, and PowerPoint into a game by integrating this directly into it. And it's fascinating that they're doing this kind of stuff. And it's a great way to, to teach people, right? Um, my company is actually working with some higher ed institutions right now all about online ed. It's like, it's uh, especially with the new generation um, I mean, your generation, right? Like, I'm an old guy, like Terry mentioned. But, you know, gaming is so integrated into everything that's happening these days that incorporating it into education and the workspace makes total sense, as much as I'm sure Leighton discussed a lot last week. And then, you know, really, this is all about statistics, right? Like we talked about at the beginning with metagames. It's stats. It's capturing stats. And there's this whole new breed of kind of personal statistics applications that are pushing this even farther. And so two good examples, mint.com, which is like a personal finance website. Um, and it was basically you connect them to all your financial accounts, and then they can track everything. How much money are you spending on coffee? You know, what's your cell phone bill? And all of a sudden, I now have stats about my monthly spending. Right? And once I have those stats, now all of a sudden I've got a feedback loop that I can use. I'm spending 100 bucks a month on Starbucks. I'm going to cut that down. I'm going to spend 50 next week, uh, next month. Right? And I do it, and I see the graph move down, and I'm playing a game. Right? And if you look, they've actually explicitly even gone in and done that now. They've been running some experiments where uh, they've got a point system on Mint. And if I save money each month, I get 1,000 points. If I get a high yield savings account, I get 250. They're turning personal finance into a game, right? You can apply this kind of these mechanics anywhere and for everything. Another good example is Nike Plus, right? The chip I put on my on my shoe connected to my iPod and it tracks as I'm running um, through. And I mean, these guys have done a beautiful job at turning personal stats and running and exercising into a game. This is a, a screenshot of their interface, and we can see things here. It's a little bit small, but. Um, I've got this little avatar that kind of changes depending on uh, how much running I've been doing. I've got challenges because they're capturing my stats and all my friends' stats. I can challenge my friends to see who can get the most miles in or who can do this run in the fastest time. All of a sudden, you're turning this, um, what used to be a completely solitary experience, into a social, competitive, challenging experience. And then this is another example. I mean, we're kind of like bridging now, like offline, uh, online, offline, right? So Nike Plus is definitely offline. There's a company called Hope Lab. It's a nonprofit up in San Mateo, and they're working on a device called the G Diddy, and it's a physical activity meter. So they're all about combating tween obesity, 11 to 14 year olds. And what they've done is, and they're prototyping this all right now, they built a little activity meter, this thing right here in the center, and you stick it in a pocket or you clip it on your belt, and then it's tracking all your activity throughout the day. And at the end of the day, you come and you plug it in to the, the USB port on your computer, it downloads all the data, and it's got all your personal stats about your activity behavior, and you're earning points. And you can compete with your friends, and you can take those points, and you can redeem them for virtual goods or for donations to charity or for gift cards. Right? So this idea of now tracking offline behavior, physical activity, and trying to drive something good for the world using game mechanics. So some other ideas in this area, um, teams and times. Peer pressure is really powerful, right? So as we talked about, people love affiliating with groups, you know, Stanford versus Cal, right? Like, I, I mean, it, it gives you this sense of being something bigger and of, of being a part of something very powerful. And so you can always do team versus team. And then even more powerfully there is like head to head within teams, right? So let's say there's two teams of 10 people and you get like one person from this team against one person from this team and you compete, right? Like that is incredibly motivating. I don't want to let down the team, right? That's the core mechanic here. If I'm competing and I'm part of a team, I don't ever want to let down the team, whether I'm part of it as a collective or whether I'm an individual on a team going head to head against another individual. And then the clock is also a powerful motivator, right? This week only, you can get this special reward for doing this or finish off in this amount of time from the point of time you started. Um, we were talking about Farmville a little bit earlier today. Um, Farmville is all about, I don't know if, how many of you know it, it's like super popular social game on Facebook, like 70 some odd million people a month playing right now. And it really leverages this one mechanic, appointment gaming, really well. You sit there and you plant crops rutabagas or soybeans or whatever. And when you do that, you know, rutabagas harvest are, are ready for harvest in 12 hours. And then you have another 12 hour window after that within to make the harvest. So you've basically made an appointment. You've said, I'm planting these rutabagas. I'm going to be back within 12 to 24 hours because otherwise they're going to die. 
right? And it's incredibly compelling. I, I mean, we're so easily kind of addicted to this kind of thing or compelled by this kind of thing. Um, you know, people are telling their friends, like, I got to be at it. You know, I got to wake up in the middle of the night to harvest my strawberries, or I'm going away on vacation. Can you take care of my farm? Like that kind of thing is actually happening, right? Because people, you know, just making this appointment, this investment that I've spent. 10, 20 points of virtual currency to plant my, my soybeans, and they're going to die, and I'm going to lose that. right? And we'll talk about loss aversion in a minute. So uh, you know, we talked a little bit about virtual goods. And there's often, you know, kind of like that marketing professor with the desk, like this disbelief around virtual goods. <clears throat> Who buys virtual goods, right? Who's stupid enough to buy like, a virtual flower to send to somebody when like, you, know, you could buy a real flower? It makes no sense. Um, and the answer is, well, you know, we all do, really. Like if you look at Look, look at a pair of jeans. Like you could buy a $10 pair of jeans, you could buy a $200 pair of jeans, right? There's not $190 worth of difference of like manufacturing and material in there. What you're paying for is the virtual. You're paying for some brand name, Citizens of Humanity versus say Walmart brand, right? You're buying virtual, you're buying something different. You know, a car doesn't need to cost me 20, 30, 50, $100,000. A car can cost me five. What I'm paying for, aside from maybe some you know, functional on, on that, is primarily virtual, right? I'm buying an intangible. I'm buying something that makes me feel good or feel a certain way or that affiliates me with a certain class of people I want to affiliate with, all those things. And all those things work in the virtual world as well, right? We all have these budgets internally in our head. Um, Entertainment budgets, identity budgets, whatever. And the identity budget's a huge one, right? Like the thing that makes us reflect ourselves. We all come to MySpace, we all come to Facebook, and on day one, we look like everybody else. We go into a virtual world, we look like everybody else, and we're willing to spend to differentiate ourselves, to make ourselves look different. And even if there's no physical presence, all those things signify something, right? They signify status, an affiliation, um, you know, a, a desire, uh, a signaling mechanism that I care for you in the case of gifts, all those kind of things. So it really, I mean, virtual goods are really no different in the kind of emotional aspect and identity aspect than real world goods are. And then social versus commercial context. You know, can, the question often comes up, comes up can non-monetary incentives work as well as monetary incentives, right? Shouldn't you be using dollars to get people to do this kind of stuff? And the only, um, and, and so the point I'll make here is that there's, People live their lives in many different contexts, and social and commercial is kind of one of the dichotomies we live in. So just to tell you a couple of stories, so let's say we're at Thanksgiving dinner, and you know, you're at Thanksgiving dinner with your mom and the rest of your family, and you know, dinner's over, and it was great. And at the end, you're going like, oh, mom, that was fantastic, and you throw 200 bucks on the table. You're like, that was great. Thanks, mom. Right? Like, what have you just done? Right? You've just switched the context from being a completely social one about family and love and all, all that kind of stuff to being a completely commercial one, right? All about dollars, right? And like your contribution and this is what it meant to me in terms of dollars. And all of a sudden you've kind of blown that dynamic. Um, the other example is lawyers. So they asked a bunch of lawyers, would you be willing to do some work for some uh, lower income uh, clients that need legal help for a reduced fee? Instead of your normal $500 an hour, how about $50 an hour? And they got like basically no uptake, right? Nobody was willing to do it. And then they switched the question to say, would you be willing to donate your time for free to these lower income clients that need help? And all of a sudden they got a huge uptake, right? Because in the first context, you were still in the commercial context, right? My time is not worth $50 an hour. My time is worth $500 an hour. Why would I reduce my, my rates this much? In the second, all of a sudden you flipped it over to the social context. I'm doing good for the world. I'm doing good for other people. It's not about my billing rate anymore, right? So just something to think about when you're, when you're building these kind of systems and trying to incent and, and, and motivate people to do things, that money isn't always like the, the be all end all, right? It's the easy solution to pay people to do what you want them to do. But there's so many other motivators. And like that slide I showed earlier with reward, status, achievement, competition, self-expression, altruism, all these things can be used and are really incredibly powerful. So section two now, uh, we're going to talk about frequency. So <clears throat> this, this one I thought was kind of counterintuitive. Animals and humans uh, work to maximize the frequency of a reward rather than the magnitude. I'd rather have a hundred one dollar rewards. It feels better for me, a hundred one dollar rewards than one one hundred dollar reward, right? So that's something really interesting to think about when you're when you're trying to incent and reward people is how what are the size of the rewards and then what are the frequencies? And so so put simply, how often is more important than how much? Mice do it, we do it. It's uh, it's crazy. So. Uh, over here on the right, what we've got is various reinforcement schedules. And so reinforcement schedules is how often are you rewarding people for doing things? And what we can see here, 
this cumulative number of responses, this axis is the good one, right? So really kind of the red curve is the best, but we'll talk about the rest of these and what they mean. So the first one we'll talk about is fixed interval, the black line here, and that's schedules that are basically a fixed point of time. So every day something happens, every hour something happens, every 15 minutes something happens, and you get a reward <laughs> just by being there during that period of time, right? So that's got kind of the lowest uh, response rate here. Variable interval schedules add an element of randomness to it. It's not every 15 minutes. Sometimes it's 13 minutes. Sometimes it's 18 minutes. Just adding that little element of randomness drives up response rates, right? We're, we're kind of hardwired. Like if we know what's going to happen, then it's less compelling than if we don't know, if there's some slight chance of uncertainty, right? We might win. We might not. You know, do I, need, do I just need to come back in 15 minutes or do I need to come back in 12 and start click, 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 clicking until like 18 when I finally get the reward and then all of a sudden I got to wait another 15 minutes and then do it again, right? Just adding this little element of randomness uh, really drives behavior. Fixed ratio is not time-based. It's response or activity-based, right? For every fifth post you make to the forums, for every fifth article you tag, you're going to get a reward. So that's pretty straightforward. And then continuous fixed ratio is basically you know, every single time, not every fifth. It's every single time. And then variable ratio is the most compelling of all these reinforcement schedules. And that is, um, again, adding the little layer of randomness, right? It's not every fifth time. Sometimes it's the third time. Sometimes it's the eighth time. You never know. And so you just sit there and you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And there's a reason slot machines are so addictive, right? And this is the reinforcement schedule that they use. All right, last section, behavioral economics. Um, Relativity and contrast. So we are all relative creatures. Everything we do is relative. I mean, this is kind of the, the standard graphic, right? Like the orange circle is the same size. It's what's surrounding it that, that gives it an impression of being bigger or smaller. Um, we're relative in, in space. We're relative in time. Um, if I've got three buckets of water in front of me, one of which is hot, one of which is room temperature, one of which is cold, and I stick my hands in the outer two buckets, and then I take them out and I put them both in the inner bucket. One hand is going to feel hot, one hand is going to feel cold, right? Because you know, it's all about what happened before um, affects so much of what I feel right now, right? And even though the water is the same temperature, my hands are going to feel something differently because we're relative. It's all about what's happened before or what's around something. Um, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm in the market for a bicycle, right, how do I know how much a bicycle should cost? Do I know the cost of manufacturing, the cost of materials, the cost of shipping, the cost of any of those things? I don't. Right? What I do know is how much all the other bikes cost, and how much a car costs, and how much a skateboard costs. And relative to all those, I can make an assessment that, yes, this bike is, rel is, is priced reasonably. Right? But I don't really know. It's all relative. It's all based on what's happened around it. Here's another good example. So I'm, 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 I wake up in the morning, and I got two things I want to go do today. I want to go buy a fancy new pen and a fancy new suit. So I go to the store, and um, I look for my fancy new pen, and it's there for 25 bucks. And I'm like, OK, great. I'm going to get my pen. Uh, but then all of a sudden, I remember I saw an ad for that same pen at a store 15 minutes away for um, $18, right? So am I willing to drive 15 minutes to save $7? 75% of people will say, no, I'm just going to buy the pen here. You know, uh, I'm sorry, 75% of people will say, yes, I'm going to drive the 15 minutes to save my $7, right? Because it's such a huge percentage of the purchase price of the pen, right? OK. Later on that day, I'm at the suit store, and I'm looking to buy a new suit. And um, I see the suit I want for $455. And somebody comes up behind me and says, hey, that same suit is available for you know, $7 less at a store 15 minutes away. You, know, um, you should go get it. And then you ask them, how many people would be willing to drive 15 minutes to save $7 on the suit? The answer is like, nobody, right? It's all relative, right? Like when it comes to the pen, I'm, will, I'm, I'm I'm going to save $7 off of 25. I'm totally willing to drive 15 minutes. When it comes to the suit, I'm going to save $7 off of 455. I'm not willing to do it. But $7 is $7. Is $7 worth 15 minutes of my time or not? Right? That's the question. And it turns out it, it depends, the answer is. right. The answer is not yes or no. It's just it depends on what's being sold. This is why sales guys in stores are always trying to sell you the high price stuff first. right? It's never buy the tie and buy this and then buy the suit because the suit seems really expensive in comparison. Or you know, why the car dealer, when you, uh, when you buy the car and then you start adding on the add-ons, I'm already spending 10 grand or 15 or whatever on a car. Sure, I'll get the power steering and I'll get the nice stereo and whatever because it's so little it, relative in comparison to the price of the car. right? Uh, the decoy effect. So this was an actual ad for The Economist magazine. <clears throat> 
online. So you could buy a subscription to TheEconomist.com online for $59. You could get the print subscription to the magazine for $125, or print and web for $125, right? And you're looking at this and you're going like, how stupid is this? You know, what idiot is going to go for this, this one when he can go for this one? And why would they even put this up here? This makes no sense, right? And if you look at the numbers, uh, like how people picked out of 100 people, you'd be absolutely right, right? Like people mostly went for the print and web subscription, um, and nobody went for the print only. But then if you take that one out, you take out the middle one, the, 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 the dumb one, right? And you've just got TheEconomist.com for $15.99 and print and web for $125. Like what happens to the numbers? You know, all of a sudden, they've just lost a bunch of money. All of a sudden, all these people are signing up just for TheEconomist.com and not for the, uh, the magazine and the website, right? And so, you know, it's pretty dramatic, right? Like 52 people difference. So what's happened? Is this called the decoy effect, right? The presence of this other option, just the mere presence of it, even if nobody picked it, was enough to drive behavior in a certain way, right? And what they call this is, uh, is like A sub A, B, right? So I've got these three options here. I've got the all expenses paid vacation to Italy, all expenses paid vacation to Italy, but I gotta pay for my own coffee, and the all expenses paid vacation to Spain. Just the existence of this one makes this one look better, right? Sub A makes A look better. Just having it there. If I've got three choices, one of which is very different, two of which are the same, except one is slightly degraded, it's gonna make more people pick the one that's not degraded. Right, because you've got this relative base to compare to now, right? It's it's something about the way we're wired to work. And so the example that Dan Ariely gives in his book is if one of your friends is always asking you to go out with him to like nightclubs or something and you look kinda like him, you should be very concerned because you might be the sub A. <coughs> <laughs> um all right, anchoring. So People anchor on numbers incredibly easily. So this is a famous one that they, um, some behavioral ec economists went out and did. They went and asked a bunch of people, is the percentage of African American nations which are members of the United Nations more or less than 45%? Then they went out and asked a separate group of people the same question except the number was 65%. The people in the second group gave uniformly higher answers than the people in the first group, right? Because they had been anchored on a number. When they heard that 45 or the 65, that set a frame of reference which they then made everything relative to. Another example of anchoring, um, this is another Dan Ariely experiment, um, Predictably Irrational, his book, it, it's great. Um, I'll, I have it in the, the recommended reading section at the end. So he's got a class full of students and hands out pieces of paper to everybody and says, okay, I want you to write down the last two digits of your social security number on the top and the bottom of this page. <clears throat> great, okay. Now, I've got these four items up here I'm going to auction off in class. I've got a uh, computer mouse, I've got a wireless keyboard, and I've got two very nice bottles of wine. And what I want you to do is write down the names of each of these items, and next to them, I want you to write down the last two digits of your social security number. So in my case, it would be 71. And then I want you to write down whether you would pay that amount of dollars for that item. So would I pay 71 bucks for the mouse? You know, no, 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 yes, maybe. Okay, so I've done that. And then he asks you, write down how much you would be willing to pay for each of those items. And you do, and you write, you write them all down, send them all into the front of the class. You know, do you think people's social security numbers had any effect on how much they were willing to pay on those things? And the answer is absolutely, right? The upper 20% of social security numbers placed bids 200 to 300% higher than the lowest 20. Everybody had been anchored on their social security number. As soon as you make that conscious um, deliberation, is this number, you know, you get anchored to that number, right? Is this number, 71, the right number? No. Well, you know, how much would I be willing to pay? Well, something less, um, as opposed to being anchored on 21, right? This is why when you, uh, you know, the, the, the checks at Cafe 51 are higher than the checks at Cafe 15. Like, this has been proven, right? Just anchoring on a number. Uh, credit card companies, <clears throat> they did an experiment where, um, uh, you know, they always give you like the minimum uh, amount you should pay on your credit card bill, right? If you take that away, people actually pay more money. If you just remove that item completely, people will pay more than the uh, minimum selected amount because they have nothing to anchor on. The credit card company is trying to anchor you low so that you remain in constant debt to them. Okay, free. The, the amazing power of free, right? There's another experiment where they ran, where they set up a desk um, at a university and they said, okay, um, students come buy chocolate. We've got two kinds of chocolate. We've got these fancy, fancy lint truffles that you can get for 15 cents. And then these Hershey's Kisses that you can get for one cent. And so people come up and they make the decision. They're like, well, do I want the fancy chocolate? 15 cents is a pretty good deal. Hershey's Kisses, one cent. Oop. 
And, uh, and you can see kind of the percentages of people that pick things, right? So a lot of people went for the truffles. Then you drop the price of each by one cent, right? So theoretically, the ratios should remain the same. <clears throat> the ratios do not remain the same, right? All of a sudden, what happens? Like all these people go for the, the Hershey's Kiss, even though, you know, really, like 14 cents difference in value shouldn't, it shouldn't matter, right? Whether you go down to zero or one or five or whatever, there should still be this equation of, I want the lint truffle worth 14 cents more and I'm going to get it. But Free's got this amazing power on people, right? And so there's a huge change in, uh, in what people picked. And the reason for that is um, most transactions have an upside and a downside, but when something is free, we completely forget about the downside, right? It feels like there is no downside. Humans are very afraid of loss, and I'll talk about that in a second. And with free, there's no possibility of losing. There's no risk in having made the wrong decision here. So, which ties in nicely to loss aversion. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, now I'm gonna get interactive. I'm gonna ask you for your, your one piece of participation in the class. So, you have your choice. You have a 50% chance of losing $200, or a 100% chance of losing $100, okay? You have a, you know, a half and half chance of losing $200 or a 100% chance of losing $100. How many of you would pick the first one? A 50% chance of losing $200. Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you would pick the second one? 100% chance of losing $100. Okay. Almost nobody. Right? Okay. I'm going to flip this question around now. You've got a 50% chance of winning $200 or a 100% chance of winning $100. Okay. Now how many of you take the 50% chance, the half and half chance? Okay, a couple of hands. How many of you take the 100% chance, the guarantee of winning 100 bucks? Absolutely, right? So why, if, if, our, if our risk profiles were the same on win and losses, we should be picking the same things on both sides, right? But they're not. When it comes to losses, we hate them. We feel them twice as much as we do gains, right? They're really exquisitely painful to us. Um, whereas uh, when it comes to, to gains, we, seek every, we do everything we can to lock in our gains. We're very conservative, right? And people are just naturally this way. They've done studies with monkeys at Princeton where they've taught them to barter in a token economy, and the monkeys do the same thing, right? It's kind of like it's hardwired into the way we, we, work, we work and we behave. And this also ties back into that farm bill thing about like, I've invested this, these 10 coins to plant my soybeans, and I'm going to lose them unless I come back in 10 hours. You know, I wake up at 3 in the morning to harvest them. I have to do it, right? Because it feels so painful to lose. It doesn't matter what it is we're losing. Uh, okay, reciprocity. This is an amazingly powerful mechanic, right? Like as society evolved from all of us taking care of all our own needs to like this distribution of, uh, of responsibility, you know, somebody else makes the food, somebody does the farming, whatever, reciprocity became the glue that holds society together. It's this thing, it's this idea that I can do something for you knowing full well that I will get that repaid at a later date, right? And if there is no reciprocity in a society, then all of a sudden everything falls apart. And that's why there's such negative connotations around people that don't live up to their end of the bargain, welchers, mooshers, whatever you want to call them, right? Like people that take advantage but don't give back. And so, you know, there's, there's fairly, fairly serious social disapproval if you don't. And so um, this is why people are always trying to give you stuff, right? When they're trying to sell you stuff, like Hare, Hare Krishnas are trying to give you flowers and, you know, um, people are sending you free samples and stuff like that because it makes you feel obligated. It's this really powerful social dynamic, right? Somebody has given me something, I need to give them something back. Um, one of the examples that I think uh, Cialdini did in his book was like, you know, um, two students are sitting in a room and uh, one asks the other one, you know, will you buy some lottery tickets for me? And it has like almost no success in selling them. But then when the first student leaves and goes out to get a Coke and brings one back for the second student, unasked, and volunteers the Coke back, now the, now the student who received the Coke feels obligated, right? I am in debt to this person. And that is an, a feeling that most of us feel very uncomfortable with. We hate being in debt to other people because of this kind of serious social dynamic around it. And so by giving me the Coke, and then when he asks me to buy lottery tickets, I'm willing to buy. And even though the Coke may have cost like 25 cents or a buck, I'm willing to spend like 10 bucks on lottery tickets, right? Because I really want to get out. Yes? Yeah, was that an idea from um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence I don't know. I've actually never read that. But that, uh, it, I'm sure it could be. Yeah, like give people stuff because then they feel obligated to you. <laughs> and it works even for... Um, the thing you give doesn't actually have to be a thing. It can be a, uh, a concession. So an example, like a, a Boy Scout comes up to you and says, would you like to buy a $10 ticket to my Boy Scout Jamboree Saturday night? And you're like, oh, I really don't want to go to the Jamboree, so no, I'm sorry. And then the Boy Scout goes, okay, well, would you be willing to buy a chocolate bar for a dollar, right? And, you know, 
Yes, of course, I'll buy the chocolate bar for a dollar because you feel bad because the kid has made a concession to you, right? He's, he's asked you for something, you've said no, and then he's come back and said, okay, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you a concession. I'm going to give you another option here that you can do. And then all of a sudden, you're willing to buy the chocolate, much more willing to buy the chocolate than you would have been if he had just asked you to buy the chocolate straight up, right out front. It's also a reverse effect. I know in sales training, you talk. Yeah. Ask the, you, know, you go to have door to door sales, you say, ask them for a drink of water. Once they've given you a drink of water, yeah. they're now more willing to buy something. Yeah, and exactly. They gave it to you. Or there have been studies done where, like, um, uh, if, you're, if you're calling someone on the phone trying to get them to buy stuff, like telemarketers, the first thing you should always be asking is, like, how are you today, right? And you get them to answer, like, fine, I'm okay. Now they've admitted that they're fine, and now it's, har they, like, now it's harder for them to turn you down, right? As, as opposed to if you just jump straight into the call. Um, yeah, so the, the, the power of reciprocity is actually very, very strong. What, what I don't know right now is like whether it works kind of with companies and people. Like individual to individual, it's incredibly powerful. But with a company, with like a name, like you know, an NBC or a Warner Brothers or somebody like that, um, would it work? If they give you something, or do you just feel like I'm taking something from the faceless corporation? That's kind of a, a stickier one that's um, interesting to think about. Commitment and consistency. So kind of on the point we're just making, after I just made the commitment that I'm doing fine, why would I not you know, donate money or buy your product? Um, and just a bunch of stories around this one. Uh, you're at the beach, and somebody comes and puts their towel and their stuff down next to you, and then they walk away, and somebody else comes up and takes it and runs off, right? Okay, so some percentage of you will go after the person. But the percentage goes up dramatically if the person who has come and left their stuff on the beach says, will you watch my stuff? Okay? He says, will you watch my stuff? And then he goes away and somebody else comes and steals it. Like people will get up and run after and tackle the people that have taken their stuff, right? It's this commitment I've made. And even though I'm, all I said was yes, right? Like that is incredibly powerful. Um, I'll get you that toy for Christmas. So toy companies apparently do this. I thought this was really sneaky. So they have a, a, a hot toy, like what was it, like Juju Pets or something this, this Christmas. And they intentionally don't make enough of them. And so all the parents have promised this to all their kids and the kids can't get it. So then what does the parent do? They got to buy them something else to make up for the Zuzu pet, right? Um, so here's the, you know, Elmo tickle hands or whatever. And then, you know, come February when there's tons of these things on the market, then the kid gets the Zuzu pets as well, right? So the toy company sold twice as much. The kid gets twice as toys and the parent's the one who got screwed, right? Because they, <laughs> they made the commitment to the kid that they were going to do this. Uh, I'll support the environment. So somebody comes door to door and says, would you be willing to put this little sign on your, um, on your, your lawn saying you support the environment. You're like, okay, sure, I do that. Once you've done that, all of a sudden your like, internal mental framework shifts to be like, I'm a person who supports the environment. So now they, they keep coming back and they, they ask you for money and you're much more willing to give it. They'll ask you if they can put su successively bigger and bigger signs on your lawn and you'll do it. Because your mental model is now, I'm a person who supports the environment and to be consistent with that mental, mo mental model, I need to continue doing this kind of stuff, right? Um, I'll bet on that horse. So the, the up until the time you have the racetrack, up until the time that you put money on the horse, you're really uncertain about whether that horse is going to win. I don't know. They could win this other one. As soon as you put the dollars down, you are 100% certain that that horse is going to win. You know it in your heart, right? Again, everything aligns in that way. Um, car dealers or car salesmen use this incredibly well. So here's kind of the, the image. You know, you've got like this table, and the table is, is the, um, the thing they're trying to get you to do, buy the car. Right? And so they're like, okay, well, you know, I think I can get you th a sweet deal on this. I'll get you like 2,000 bucks off this car. And you're like, okay, cool. I've been considering the car. And now they've like taken the table and they've put like one big um, post underneath the center of the table and saying like, I'm going to get a sweet deal on this car, right? And then as soon as they've done that, then you start putting up your own legs on the four corners of the table. Like, I'm going to look pretty sweet in that car. It's going to help me like, you know, um, get to work on time. It's going to save my commute. It's going to be really comfortable. You've built all these other legs up underneath. And then he goes and he talks to his manager and he comes back and saying, like, I'm sorry, we can't do this $2,000 off deal. And, you know, he takes away the center leg, but you've built the other ones now, right? Because your whole, you know, you made the mental decision, I'm going to do this. You made the commitment in your head that I'm going to get this deal, I'm going to do it. You built up all these other legs, he swiped it out, and now he's got you, right? Now you're like, now it's so hard to fight our nature that, like, well, I already made the decision to buy this. I'm just, you know, it's going to do so many other good things for me. I'm just going to go ahead and buy it. Um, social proof. So we're all, we're all like, 
you know, as we mentioned, relative creatures. We all don't always know what the right behavior is, and so we look to other people to tell us what the right behavior is. So the tip jar in, in any restaurant, right? They never put it out empty. You put it out with money in it. You seed it so that people think that other people are putting tips in. Ringers in the audience, um, man on the street interviews, right? So um, we're going to go talk to people just like you out on the street, right? And that's what's going to tell you what to do. Uh, McDonald's with the over 99 billion served, that tells you something, right? 99 billion people or burgers can't be wrong. So, you know, something must be right about this. Uh, I think it was Cialdini again, the what to do if you need help. So there was this like crazy story, I think it was written up in Freakonomics too, about, you know, this woman in New York who got attacked and like there was hundreds of people in the, um, the surrounding buildings that were witnessing this and nobody did anything. Nobody went down there, nobody called 911, and everybody was kind of like, you know, shocked at the you know, decline of Western civilization and stuff. But really, it was all about like, nobody knew what to do, and nobody knew if anybody else was doing anything, and it's this kind of weird, uncomfortable thing, right? So what he basically says is, look, if you get hurt, or you know, somebody you know is hurt, and, and they're lying there, you can't expect people to come just help you on their own. You need to call people out. You need to say, you, call 911. You, get an ambulance, right? And that, like, then they're, they're being told what to do, right? You have to like, shock them out of this, like, I don't know what to do phase. And then this whole social norms thing is kind of fascinating. Robert Cialdini, who wrote the, this great book, Influence, he's been doing a lot of work on this recently. He's actually also the advisor to a company called Opower, which is doing some cool stuff in this around energy. But the example I'll give you is a study he did in hotels. So um, in hotels, they're trying to reduce the number of towels that get used. And so they, they did this series of experiments where they would put messages in the rooms um, telling the, uh, the occupants something. So 75%, the first message, 75% of people that visit hotels reuse their towels. Okay, great. So that doesn't have a whole lot of effect on towel usage. 75% of people in this hotel um, reuse their towels. Okay, slightly more, but not a whole lot. 75% of the people that were in this room reused their towels. All of a sudden, skyrockets, right? Like now, all of a sudden, you've built this, this community across space and time of people I've never met, of everybody who's ever stayed in this room and is going to stay in this room, and I'm part of that community. And what this community does, what we do, is we reuse our towels 70% of the time, right? <laughs> it's crazy, but it, but it works. And so um, social norms, knowing what other people are doing, like incredibly powerful. So Opower, this company, um, they're actually using it to get people to save electricity, right? There's all sorts of technical things you can do uh, with the grid and with meters and with all that kind of stuff to get people to use uh, or to conserve electricity. But, you know, people are the biggest users of electricity. So how do we get them to do it? And so Opower is doing stuff like on the, they send out energy statements to people where you can see how you're doing compared to all your neighbors, to people with similar square footage houses and layouts, um, little smiley faces or sad faces, depending on how you're doing compared to everything else. And it's driving down electricity usage, right? It's turned electricity usage into a game into a social norm thing where I can compare with other people. And then scarcity. I mean, people assign more value to opportunities when they're less available. People hate having options taken away. They hate having doors closed. They always seek to have the most doors and options available always. And so, um, and then, uh, yeah, people hate to lose choices. And scarce items are heightened in value when they're newly scarce, right? If things have been scarce all along, it's one thing. But when they're going to become scarce, you know, Disney with their um, get, get Cinderella now before we lock it up in our vaults for another seven years, like they do these release windows, right? Like that drives incredible purchase for Disney. And then it's especially powerful when they're competing with others for them. So uh, a bunch of recommended reading here. So Influence by Robert Cialdini is kind of the classic. That book's been around forever. Predictably Irrational came out a, a year or two ago. Dan Ariely, really good. Um, Freakonomics is all about incentives and how they don't always work the way people want them to, um, depending on how people are incented. This is a good search term on Wikipedia, Cognitive Biases, if you want to learn more. Um, Byron and Layton's book from last week, Total Engagement, is uh, talking a lot about how this can be used in the, in the workplace. And Changing the Game uh, by David Ettery and Ethan Mollick is also another good one that's kind of a broad spectrum of games in, uh, in the workplace and education and stuff. So, you know, I'll, I'll send this deck to Terry. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, I tweet about this kind of stuff. I mean, I don't tweet about anything else except for, you know, interesting use of game mechanics, behavioral economics, etc. in the world. And so if you want to follow us on Twitter, and we're hiring. We're looking for good, you know, engineers and product people. So if you want to work with me and other um, smart people, let me know. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Given that you now spill the beams and all those uh, books tell all the tricks, what if people read these books or listen to your talks? What fraction of people will still fall for the same, the same tricks? <laughs>
A huge portion of them will. <laughs> a, a large portion. Yeah, that's it's hard. hard. It's hard. This stuff is like hardwired into us, right? Like my sister's getting a PhD in behavioral economics at Harvard, and she's telling me, like, you know, I know all this stuff, and yet it's so hard. It's so innate and natural that it takes a very conscious effort to kind of see what's going on and to try to counteract it. It's hard. Any other? Oh, yeah, please. So you're talking about avatars and kind of the virtual representations. Of yeah. How real should these uh, avatars be? Kind of help us get a feel of, I mean, another person on the computer. How, I mean, what's your experience in that? Yeah, I don't think they need to be real at all. I mean, like you know, representations of things don't need to be high fidelity, right, to get points across. So they can be really low, low fidelity, low res. They don't need to be three D. I mean, avatars are. I mean, really, like a desk could be my representation. That tells something about me, right? So I don't think um, it's kind of that old, like you know. Zork was just as immersive as World of Warcraft, just in a very different way, right? It was text, completely text. And you can get immersion at any different level, and you can get identity reflection at any different level as well. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, please. You had mentioned social versus uh, commercial yeah. um, uh, context. Yeah. Um, when, you, uh, when you're doing things sort of in a virtual sense, like virtual currencies and that sort of stuff, I mean, have you, have you seen kind of similar challenges in terms of um, how you incent kind of a social context versus a virtual context when you're doing things like virtual currency. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, so tell me if I, if I get it wrong. Okay. But, you know, there's definitely, you want to, if there's, if there's dollars involved in the system, you want to keep those separate, right? You, don't, you never want to conflate currencies in a system. So, like, there's a currency I can earn by doing social things and engaging and doing other things and that can be used for one set of things and then there's a dollar currency that if I have it on my system where I can earn or buy or do whatever and I want to keep those separate because you don't again you don't want people to you don't want them ever to go in into your system and think like I'm I'm really getting paid seven cents an hour to do this come right back together in eBay? what's that don't they come back together in eBay? do they have a virtual currency no, no, I'm saying where oh. people sell oh money. yeah 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 <laughs> Yes, they do, absolutely. Gold farming and stuff like that. But none of the, none of the um, game guys want that to happen, right? They're all fighting gold farming on eBay and stuff like that. But there, actu there absolutely is. Uh, you just got to be careful. So, I mean, I'll tell you a story. There's um, a, a 3D avatar chat company called Imvu, and IMVU. Eric Rees, he gave a talk at, or he's going to give a talk at Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders. If you haven't, if he's already done it, you should check it out online. If he hasn't, you should go see it. He's a really good speaker. So he was telling me the story about how Imvu um, so Imvue had a credit economy, and the credits are things I buy with real dollars, right? And I spend them on virtual goods to customize my avatar and my space and things like that. And the credits were like a thousand for a dollar, so they're you know, a tenth of a cent a piece. And so they built a slot machine at one point in time that I could sit there and I could play with credits. And the slot machine would pay out over 100%, it would pay like 107%. So over the course of an hour, I would get like you know, an extra 70 credits or something. So I was make and, and the whole time they're showing me ads and other things that they're trying to monetize me. And you know, so at the end of the hour, I've made essentially seven cents, right, of sitting there playing the slot machine. And they thought nobody was going to do this, but people were, right? People were spending tons of time on this. And I think what he realized, what I realized, is that here in the valley, here if you're working at a startup, you know, if you're, if, if you're a student, you know, you're often um, uh, time poor and cash rich, relatively, right? I'm not, you know, none of us is rich, but um, time poor for sure. We have a lot less time than we have dollars, and we're willing to, you know, to, to pay for convenience. And then a huge portion of the world is the exact opposite, right? They're time rich and cash poor. They have tons of time to spend sitting there playing the slot machine to earn seven cents an hour to get the credits that I can use to customize my avatar, right? Yeah. Uh, do you know anything any that uh, they can combine the mechanical Turk of Amazon system and uh, the game environment? Um, so people have just recently integrated mechanical Turk into the uh, payment mechanisms for games, like. So on the social networking sites, all these games like um, Mob Wars and Farmville and all that kind of stuff, they all sell things for real dollars. And one of the options you can now use is to um, do Mechanical Turk tasks to earn the dollars to buy the virtual goods. Uh, but actually turning them into a game, well, there's, there's um, <coughs> Luis Van, Van, Van Ons? Van Ons. Luis Van Ons work at Carnegie ESP Mellon, right? Game. Yeah, the ESP game. and. Um, is it Guap? Guap, I can't remember the name of. He's got a whole series of games that do that, like the recapture and stuff like that, where he's basically, you know, but distributing. It's usually one or the other. Uh, one yeah, no, not that I've seen yet, actually. That's actually a really interesting idea. Great, yeah. So once people are inside of the virtual 
community, they spend a lot of time and effort to personalize their experience and everything. But what are the reasons why people will get into that virtual community in the first place? Like, why should someone start playing Farmville? Yeah, why should someone start playing Farmville? So, um, it's a very good question. <coughs> 78 million people out there to ask. <laughs> uh, so usually it's because, um, well, I mean, there's two reasons, right? It's content or community, right? It's, there's something there that is compelling and interesting that I want to experience, and it's continually fresh, so I keep coming back, because if it doesn't, then it gets stale. And there's people there that I want to do this with, right? And so those are the two primary reasons for any, any, any of those experiences to take off. And then things like Facebook games kind of leverage the second in a, in a really aggressive manner. Like, you can only... Um, get to the next level in this game if you invite 10 of your friends to join, right? And so they kind of force that socialness on you. So I'm willing to invite, you know, people I don't even care about. Great. Other questions? Cool. Okay, thank Thanks. You. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.